India pro pro provides has a written form. It is an oral culture. It's always been an oral culture. Even now, as print literacy has improved and it's around about, I don't know, 70%, it is still in the ways that it uses media technologies, it is still an oral culture. So digital media and apps are people nodding. That, that's what it is. Um, in the 70s, the king decreed that Zonka only naturally spoken by half the country. Zonka would become the national language. It's part of unifying the country that everybody learns Zonka and that everybody learns English because it's the international language. So both languages are an ongoing project in the country, um, which is the context for my project. So this is the project. Number one, to influence how Bhutan is represented on English Wikipedia because some of it's good, some of it's excellent, and some of it is cringeworthy because references used are Lonely Planet rather than the, you know, the written material out of Bhutan, rather than the local experience. Because you know, to go to Bhutan, you go for a holiday, you're there, you're there for a week, that's the access that you can have as an outsider. That's why Lonely Planet reads like it does, but when that's the reference for the Wikipedia pages, it's a problem. So the influence, to influence how Bhutan is represented on English Wikipedia means Bhutanese need to engage, step up, you know, know how to and represent Bhutan themselves on English Wikipedia. Once that's stage one of the project, once that's completed and Bhutanese understand the logics, the referencing, all of the um, rules and why they're there, the, the traditions, all of how Wikipedia has evolved, then Zonka Wikipedia is there and is ready to, for them to take charge. And the third one is that they should be part of the global movement. So I have a couple of, or I have a whole host of research partners, but the ones I want to point out is University of Bhutan, who are, um, embrace this project. They see, they understand the potential that Wikipedia has for their citizens. So they're very keen. The other one is the Bhutan Advisory Committee. So it's not appropriate for me to come into the country and <laughs> hear Wikipedia. So I have a series of um, various civil leaders who have all agreed to be this advisory panel that will constantly check what we're doing and how it's working. My research friends, uh, the Wikimedia community, Australia has already stepped up. Um, India um, have been in contact with various members over different times. And as the project develops, nodding, as the project develops, I'll be calling on you more. The Wikimedia Foundation has already funded one round of me doing the pilot. And that pilot then led to me getting funding from the Australian government to do a three-year project pre-COVID doing this. That's where we're up to. English Wikipedia. So the Zonka Wikipedia was started, and I haven't got it in front of me now, but some years ago as part of a particular year where there was a drive to bring new communities in. And a Canadian man who'd spent many years in Nepal and was currently in Bhutan, and who can do Zonka, um, created Zonka for Linux and is, was hired by the Zonka Development Commission. He is a Wikipedian. So he helped create Zonka Wikipedia and he put, did all these initial stubs and it's gone nowhere. And in the last <laughs> year, no visits except me to check the others. So the possibilities as I have put, pitched it to the Bhutanese communities is, Education, you know, you will all understand immediately why. Education is just fabulous. Tourism, and they do have lots of fantastic footage and historical documents that would that tell the, some of the history of the Himalayas in general, you know, beyond their own borders. They're an important part of the whole Himalayan story over history. So all of that's good. The possibilities for Zonka Wikipedia are where I get really excited as a researcher. 
So because it's a national project for everybody to learn Zolka, there's just so many opportunities in the school. What's that? Is it made tough running at a time? No. <laughs> Um, it's a site of inclusion for all Bhutanese languages. Now, the fact that all the others are oral without a written form shouldn't mean they can't be included on, on the Zonka site. The way that the ways that Bhutanese use digital media show that they that they, that they think laterally, they do it in new ways. And that's what I'm excited about, how they might use the audio and video affordances of the platform to actually be representative of their other languages. So the example that I give is there's a, a fabulous place called Membazo Lake. Um, it's on the tourist trail, so in English Wikipedia, yep. you can get all the information on there. But on Zonka Wikipedia, they could record and upload oral um, interviews in different languages for that area, and that could sit alongside whatever it is that comes up on Zonka. So because that, that's the creative innovative bit, and I look forward to seeing how that unfolds. So this was the first pilot, and I worked to understand, you know, to present it and hear back and understand what their concerns were, you know, where it landed. Um, I had a group of Zonka newspaper editors, and I did a training session with them in Timpu, and that was in 2019. And it was, well, it was just fabulous. They were so engaged, so into it. It was just so much fun. And they were horrified once they actually looked at some Wikipedia pages about Bhutan and realised, oh, but that's, that's terrible. Yep. <laughs> there we are, checking, checking. So COVID hit. My project was due to start March 2020. So... Uh, I went back to teaching, didn't take the time off to do the, take the research leave. And instead I pivoted. So there is, an, outside Bhutan, Australia has the highest population of Bhutanese. It's a weird quirk of, we have a, a really strong and weird connection. There's about 15,000 Bhutanese living in Australia now. Most of them, about 12,000 of them are in Perth and about 3,000 are in Canberra and the rest are sort of dotted around. And they're mostly here for study, for tertiary study. And they bring their families. So I pivoted to the Bhutanese community. And this is this year starting some, and the Australian community turning up beautifully to help. It was a modest success. <laughs> what did I tell you? <laughs> no. Yes, well, let's just hope that improves. So that was um, the starting point. So uh, what I'm hoping to do now is go back next year. In 2023, I'm going to go in around March and re-engage with that advisory committee and with the various groups of knowledge holders that the Royal University of Bhutan and I had identified. And that includes retired civil servants, editors, school teachers, monks, and I forget the other ones, we had six. Anyway, and to create these editing circles with those knowledge holders, and that will be, that, that's how we're gonna do it. Now that I have managed to engage some in Australia, then there will be a, hopefully a cohort that can connect virtually and that's the plan. So that's Bhutan. The second project I want to tell you about, because this one I really need help with. So in um, 2019, just before COVID hit, I went with a group of Australian University of Sydney um, researchers. There was something like 60 of us. And we went around India with the idea being we were to make collaborations and all part of encouraging um, better better um, collaborations between Indian universities and Australian ones. And at TIS, Tata Institute of Social Sciences in Mumbai, we had we did it under this umbrella of anthrop anthropomorphic change. How can you help? So there was a room full of 50 researchers from University of Sydney, from medicine, architecture, me from you know media and comms, 
right across the board. There was law, um, anyway, geography, and the same, the people who were interested from TIS stepped up. And we did this mad speed dating where we ended up with all these key words. You had to go to a corner where your key word was or group of key words. And out of that, I sat with six people and the two TIS professors were gerontologists, which is all about active ageing. And that, so we had to come up with a theoretical project that combined all our research interests. And this is what we came up with. So it's, <laughs> naturally, I came up with well, Wikipedia. We can train old people on Wikipedia, brilliant. And they started to get excited. How would that work? And then we got into the inter We had to stretch it and whatever to fit the anthropogenic migration, but we managed to. I'll just spare you those hoops, all that funding kind of language. Um, so that's a next week I'm going to India for the first um, meetings with our whole team because we're actually now going to do this. And we're going to do this with a cohort in Mumbai of Tamil diaspora and a community of the Tamil diaspora in Sydney. And we're going to train both lots. We're going to, you know, intergenerational transfer of knowledge is what my TIS professors are excited about. Um, in Australia, it's actually been really easy to find Tamil Wikipedia editors. I've had more trouble in Mumbai. <laughs> so that, that's the next step and why I would um, like your help. So um, in the last session, what were we sort of, you know, in five years, I would love to see Bhutanese people here that are part of a really healthy Bhutanese chapter and to be able to report back that the Tamil Seniors is a fantastic project that was a huge success. Um, we have funding from the University of Sydney to do the first, to do this, to get this far. And then I'll be coming to the Wikimedia Foundation for funding to actually do the project. And it will then, you know, hopefully form a paper and a, a case study of how we could do it. Okay, thank you. Uh, because we will. Uh, Give it to the floor. If you have any questions to Dr. Wendy, please raise your hand. Yes, sir, over there. I'm going to open the microphone to you. You want to introduce your name in your country, please? You, uh, my name is Rachel. I work for the Wikimedia Foundation and I live in India. And but you have had a couple of conversations about this. Uh, so it's not a question, it's just a I think it's it's wonderful to see um, in a way like a, a cross regional collaboration here, where we have ECM from our uh, perspective, and we have some as well, which is also something that we are looking at from how do we make different regional communities work with each other, and if this could be kind of like a I don't know like an example of that and build on further from it because you see. Technically, it's Australia and Bhutan and South Asia and ECM in a way from our regionalization perspective. And I think it's amazing. So, of course, we will continue to offer any uh, help possible. Hopefully, find some Tamil that can be just in Mumbai. But I just wanted to say it's amazing what you're doing. And we really do need a, we do want to build a community in Bhutan. That, that's one of the things that we're looking forward to as well. So, congratulations for that. Can I just say that, that there are editors in Bhutan and they're all working sort of disparately and I've contacted various and so it, it's sort of all there and there is a Bhutan wiki project page that started years ago long before me and there's all sorts of somebody's done so much work probably the guy who did the set up Zonka um, there's lists there's there's a whole it, it's just waiting to kind of hit tipping point. Thank you so much. Let's give another round of applause to Dr. Kelly. Now, after discussing about a very interesting project in the academics related to uh, the new EDS language, allow me to invite Kokuyo and Joyce. Uh, we are going to discuss about BT data and independent art space in Taiwan. So, Kokuyo is Chinese BT admin, graduated from contemporary art theory. Uh, master researcher in uh, Yuan and 
Don't use it. But you can use that one. So, yeah, yeah, uh, other place. A time based media are conservatory and researchers. So, without further ado, the state is yours. Hello? Ah, what do you call? We are. That is yours. Hi. Oh, this time, yeah, this part, I'll use Chinese. Then, the English part, I'll put it on the PPT. So, don't worry. PPT is all, it's all. Okay. Oh, oh, you everybody know my English is not very, very bad, right? Not very, very bad. <laughs> so I use Chinese. Yeah. <笑> OK， 呃，新乐园艺术空间是台湾的一个独立艺术空间。那他在过去呢，在过去是一群艺术家，在一九九五年的时候，然后为什么会有啊？<笑>在一九九五年的时候成立，然后并持续运作在今到今天。那在今今年二零呃二零二二年，然后我们跟维维京媒体基金会。申请了 Wikim 呃 Alan Fund， 然后做了这个计划。那这是新乐园艺术空间的样子。那我们的计划目标大致可以分成三点。第一点，我们在 Wikidata 上里面输入艺术家的资料，然后艺术的资料首先是以艺术家的为主，然后之后再慢慢扩张、扩及到其他不同类型的资料，例如文献、书籍、作品、展览等等等。例如说，可以看到，呃，艺术家跟作品，或者是艺术家跟出版物，他的 book of 呃 paper right， 呃 link linking data OK， <笑>好，那我们第二第二项计划的呃第二项计划目标是 Wikidata 台湾社群，希望通过这次机会掌握 Wikibase 的技术。呃 ，Wikibase 是什么？去问哎，德国人。那我们实际掌握这个技术之后，我们希望把这个技术呢，再交给就是扩及到其他专业的领域应用上。那大家可以看到那个图，右右下角是维基媒体的计划，哎 ，the link it to Wikidata， 哎 ，Wikidata to Wikibase 生态系，我不会讲生态系的 English， 然后 Wikibase 生 Wikibase link to 呃。Linking, linking open data web. Fuck. <laughs> okay, right. It's linking, 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 linking. Hey, no. I, I have said this is a future. What the fuck? Right. 接着这上上面前面讲的第一项跟第二项目标，我们希望通过这个 linking open data 的技术，能够让 wiki base。Wikidata 在台湾艺术圈就是打进去，就是深入艺术圈，然后能够促进那个呃艺术场域的讨论以及它的生态的改变。So what？ 嗯哼，怎么了？哦，连到美术馆。OK， 反反正那个 Linking Data， 呃 ，Wikidata to 呃 Linking Open Data to Museum， 不不不，呃 ，Glen。OK， 呃，哦耶。OK， 不要。好，那我们目前的成果呢，也是可以分成三项。那首先，我们已经建了四千五百笔资料，四千五百笔逐一批的资料。那这些都是以艺术家资料为主，那包含艺术家的性别、他的出生地、他的学历或者他的他他的师生关系。那我们认为这样做的话，可以让提供学术界有个基础的研究资料。那这个就是 ，you know， wiki data page， 呃 ，is for 王安安皮斯，王俊杰 ，is my teacher friend， teacher friend， <笑> not my teacher。哦，那在 wiki data 部分呢，我们同样的选了几本台湾的杂志，艺术杂志，然后批量导入，呃，十几年来 ten years 啊的文章资料，然后大家可以想象的是把 on piece。And page linking 
you can you can do, do a search research, right? Oh shit! <laughs> oh, uh, so this is uh, you know, uh, uh, we can see a page for anti like <laughs> 哦、oh, ，好，那在第二项部分呢，我们也就在 Wikibase 的部分 ，Wikidata 社群，我们的 Wikidata 社群呢，已经真的掌握到 Wikibase 的技术了。那在这之后呢，我们要希望能够讨论如何在 Wikibase 里面介入内容，然后进呢，同时也要针对这个部分进行讨论与思考。那在计划展望的第三部分，也就是在第计划展望的部分，我们希望跟 Ryan Ryan。跟图书馆借、跟博物馆借什么潜力进行学习他们的经验，然后利用这些经验一起推动台湾艺术圈的改变，然后一些反正就是 change 商圈。哦，呃呃，这是 Rhino on base， 也是它是基于 on wiki base 的一个资料库。那在计划反射部分，这个要比较 serious， 就比较严肃的来讲一下。OK， 好，呃，等，好，好，好，等呼吸 ，Freeze，OK，OK，OK， 哦，就这样，我在这边引用古迪古迪尔的理论讲的，不同场域的人，大家都知道，每个人都每个场域的人都是独立的，但他彼此又是这样联联系在一起的。那我认为，在维基媒体运动中，我们大致可以分成三个场域：第一个是计划，第二个是社群，第三个是利益相关者。那首先我想要提到的是 project 计划的部分，在维基计划的时候，它主要都是在过去主要都是提到的是内容知识内容的成长，例如都是条目，或者是资料 data， 或者是各种的 media 等等。那这在过去也是我们最主要的工作的目标。但是有个问题是，我们在这个计划中发现是，如果只是过度追求一个维基媒体计划内容的成长的话，对于一些利益相关者来说，并不是最首要的目标。那因为这些利益相关者并不不一定很在乎这些东西，或他这是他首要的。那如果我们一直过度强调呃内容的成长的话，反而可能会限制了我们的影响力。那在第二个部分是关于社群的部分，呃 ，community 的部分。呃，社群我认为它主要是想思考是它如何永续的成长，然后那同时也掌握一些基本的技术能力，例如 Wikidata 和 Wikipedia 的撰写的编辑能力等等。那在过去我们常常会把维基媒体计划的内容增长跟社群的永续发展直接等同在一起，但是但是把在一些计划里面，像 Wikidata 的计划里面获得一些很专业的或者专题的。活动筹办里面，我们会看到是，呃，对于社群来来说，拥有具备不同面向的呃人，然后能够为这些不同专业的人提供服务的话，反而对于社群的永续发展可能是更为重要的。那最后在利益相关者的部分，我觉得这是最严肃的，也是而且也是呃，也是亚洲地区、阿亚地区最大的困难，在于我们与欧美地区很多的情况是非常的不一样。例如很多单位相对来说并不愿意开放这些档案，然后我们过长的 work p o u s e 会影响到我们的职工愿意投入这投入这些计划或者这些编辑的时间等等。那在社会相对保守的情况下，我我们我觉得亚洲的维基媒体运动可能要更加直接的介入，去影响利益相关者的部分。那对 ，OK。那小杰，反正有 wiki， 反正计划社群利益相关者这三个人，虽然彼此都是不同的，但是呢，他不代表我们一定要配合其中一方的意意见，利不不论是利益相关者的意见，或者是维基那计划要求内容增长部分，这两者都是不好的。所以要怎么办呢？还懂吗？哦，不是，要怎么办呢？或许我们可以先这样试着问问自己，在未来的十五年内，我们一想要一起实现的是什么？这个未来不只是我们维基媒体运动，也就是这大各位的未来，也包含了对于这个所属世界的整个未来。那我们既然是联盟的关系，很明明明白白的，我们的利益、目的、想法、习惯本来就会不同，但是我们还是有办法。Linky， 那我们要高度的回家了。
And I am going to open one question for person computer panel. Please raise your hand. Yes. What's the ball? What other activities are you doing today? And what other <laughs> or or all I, challenges. No, it could say, it could say, could you zoom up? Oh, so, uh. so he's concerning about is it okay to speak up here? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, what challenge? Uh,呃,罗志做艺术档案,那在最大的问题是很多,就像刚才提到不同西方的经验,不同西方美术馆或博物馆已经有完整的资料库,那他们的经典的模式或者基金会所教导我们的模式是借由说服或者一个共同未来,把这
I'm going to talk about the Wikimedia Alliance Fund project we started a few months ago, and in particular, how I've gone about engaging with the Wikimedia community um, to date and how we can do more of that as the project progresses. Um, just a bit of context, I'm new to the Wikimedia community. Um, so this has been um, really eye-opening and positive experience. Um, so just a little bit about the Analysis and Policy Observatory. APO was established 20 years ago by academics at Swinburne University based in Melbourne. Um, that was in 2002, one year after Wikipedia was founded. Um, APO is Australia and New Zealand's largest open access repository of policy and research reports and other material published by organised organizations. Um, this is also known as grey literature. Um, because grey literature is not published by professional publishers, um, it, it is scattered across the internet. So at APO, we source this content and we create metadata for it so that it's discoverable and searchable on our open access repository, as well as across the internet on internet search engines. Um, APO also plays an important role in disseminating policy and research. Um, we've got 15,000 newsletter subscribers across Australia and New Zealand. Um, and we don't have a guaranteed source of funding, so we raise income from a range of products and services. Um, we have a full-time editor who sources and catalogues content, and we have more than um, 39,000 resources. Um, in addition to this, anyone can sign up for a free APO account and add published material to APO. Um, this is moderated by our editors and it has to meet our content policy. So APO's vision is that society is improved through evidence-based decision-making because there is open access to policy and research. And so our mission is to make policy and research as accessible as possible. So APO does play a central role in Australia and New Zealand's free knowledge ecosystem. So um, thanks for Amanda for these slides. Um, so here are just some examples of the types of reports we have on APO. So you can see here we have major um, international non-government and quasi-government organisations such as the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the United Nations, the OECD. And we also have reports from universities, research institutes, government departments and agencies, community groups and advocacy organisations as well. Um, I know that um, some feedback I've got from the Wikimedia community is not to source advocacy organisations, but that gets a bit tricky because um, advocacy organisations are realising um, more and more that to put a good case forward, they need to engage with um, and commission rigorous research um, and get ad academics to produce research to um, help their work as well. Um, so our project being funded through the Alliance Fund is called The Missing Link, Incorporating Policy Reports into the Free Knowledge Ecosystem. Um, and the aim is to improve the presence of valuable policy and research material and coverage of important policy issues in Wikimedia. Um, policy reports and material published by organisations is not a common type of publication sourced in Wikipedia at the moment. The most common types of sources are news and media websites and commercially published material, such as books and journal articles. Um, but there are three reasons, I think, material published by organisations that aren't commercial publishers is a useful source of information for Wikipedia. Um, the first is currency. So while news media contains the latest and most up-to-date information, it often doesn't present in-depth research or policy on a particular issue. And while books and journals do fill this gap, um, the time taken to publish this leads to a loss of currency. It takes a lot of time. 
The second is accessibility. So the other issue with the reliance on academic sources is that they are often written for an academic audience, whereas material published by organisations is usually written for the general public. And it often um, is a great source of academic work. So academics, when they want to reach a wider audience, will publish their own material. And finally, smaller organisations, such as those that are First Nations led or from the Pacific and the other unrepresented communities are more likely to publish their own material rather than through um, commercial means. So what we're aiming to do in this project is the first step is using APO's database to verify the most reputable and notable publishing organisations and sources. Um, feeding APO report metadata into Wikidata. And then the next step will be then to um, have an editor on, on a public policy issue to try and use those sources in Wikidata. Okay, so the first step in this project was to determine of the publishing organisations we have on APO, which ones can be considered reliable so that we can upload their report um, metadata to Wikidata. Um, so the most obvious place we um, went to was the Reliable Sources Notice Board, where discussion takes place on whether a publication is reliable. Um, however, we faced a bit of resistance um, from the community on the notice board in getting an assessment on whether an organisation could be considered as a reliable source. Um, this is because this decision is often the result of assessments of many articles that have been sourced in Wikipedia, so that was fair enough. Um, so from there, we were directed to the Village Pump and a wiki project called Source Metadata. Um, where we asked for some more advice on how we were going to determine what our reliable source was. Throughout this process, we uncovered and keep uncovering various guidelines on the subject of reliability, and sometimes they don't always match up or are consistent um, and always present it in them a slightly different way. So when we were engaging in, in these forums, I didn't get as many answers as I was expecting. In fact, I just got a lot of information of you can't do this and you can't do that, but I was able to take that information and turn it into an approach that we could use. So overall, my experience was collaborative and I received some positive feedback. And as someone who is very passionate about evidence-based decision-making, I was very happy to receive this little piece of feedback here. Um, which that someone said, uh, user 69203143737, if you're here, thank you. And they said, your candor and willingness to apply fact-based principles is refreshing. So I thought that was really good. <laughs> okay, so when I presented yesterday, um, I received some useful feedback and interesting viewpoints about whether I should upload everything from APO into Wikidata. Um, and some people were saying, you should just put it all onto Wikidata, um, everything you've got on APO. But I've also, over the last two days, heard some stories of where there has been use of unreliable sources, um, which has been really difficult to manage and to stop as well. So at this stage, I think it's important to do a bit of filtering and see how we go um, first up. So by being selective, I think we will support the use of reliable sources, as well as make the life of ed editors a little bit easier as well, so their work. So our approach would be to select reports that could be given the no consensus rating that's used on the reliable sources notice board. Um, so it would be reliable depending on the context and an in-text attribution will be required. So our first step is that we're going to select a number of publishing organisations across Australia and New Zealand that we have on APO. 
um, and we'll be excluding advocacy organisations at this stage because that's from a, a clear direction we've got. Um, and the second step is then to select, make sure that the reports of those publishing organisations could be considered reliable. So we'll be focusing on um, policy statements and reports that are based on research, just so that we're excluding those opinion-based um, articles and reports. Um, so the most important part of this project is encouraging the use of these new reports that will be in Wikidata. And so we have proposed to conduct an edited song, but I'm really interested in exploring other ways we can support editors to use these sources in Wikidata to create new content on public policy issues for Australia and New Zealand. Um, one idea I had was to cur curate um, a source or bibliographic list on a particular issue. So we say, um, these are all the sources we have in Wikidata on homelessness. And so then when someone wants to go and create or edit content on homelessness, they'll have the sources there in easy reach. So that was just one idea. And Toby Hudson, who was here, also suggested that maybe we could have separate to this project, have a button on APO, on every report on APO, that would enable you just to click a wiki button, which enable you to source that material on um, Wikipedia. So I'm really keen about any other ideas you may have. Um, so I'll just end by saying, I hope this is the beginning of a very beautiful relationship between um, Wikimedia and APO within the free knowledge ecosystem. Unfortunately, uh, due to the constraint of time, uh, we need to end this second, but don't worry, after this we have another second, and allow me to share a token of appreciation for our speakers today from the committee, so I would like to invite all the speakers from. Let's give a big round of applause to our speakers today.